your son's on the street and you're in prison. This ain't gangster. So I started to detox and debrief from chasing the goal of being a gangster and a hustler to trying to understand on what it was going to take to be a successful father. I want to say good afternoon to a mogul, an entrepreneur, business manager, um, WAC 100. How you doing, my sir? How you doing, sir? Great. I'm doing great. I'm doing great. I'm doing great. Very special day. I want to thank your daughter for making this happen. Start it off correctly. Definitely. Yeah, this is, uh, this is the first booking uh, coming from my daughter that's way in the United States. So I don't know how you found her, or how you got to her, <clears throat> but she told me, Dad, I'm building a relationship. You can't charge, and you need to be there. I thought about it, and I said, you know what? You know how many times I've told my artists, listen, this is a build of a relationship. You never know uh, how big this platform will grow or who this individual is going to become. So I don't know if she listens to me on my conference calls or she's thinking about me, but this is a very, very uh, special interview because my daughter set it up. You know what I mean? So you know I'm here. We're in London. We're live in London. I, one thing I've always looked at is, um, you know, being, like, I'm yet to be a father, but when I look at all the things that you've gone through and how much love you got for your kids and how you're trying to give them a better life, I've always wondered, is that one of the main motivations for you to transcend and change your life around your kids? Always. Yeah, you know, it, was, it wasn't until it wasn't about me that I, I, I started thinking about other things. You know, when it's about you and you're a kid and you run around reckless and you just trying to figure it out and you trapped in this box. <clears throat> then you start to think about other things. Uh, first thing you think about is you don't want your kids to grow up in this box. So now you start to think about how can you get out? So then you start to cancel out things. Those things that we think are fun. Those things that get you in trouble that send you to prison, send you to jail because you don't want your children to grow up in this. So um, I broke the cycle, right, for my children. My father didn't break the cycle. He kind of went backwards because he grew up in a good neighborhood and, and regressed down to the ghetto. The rest of my cousins grew up in a good neighborhood. Drugs brought him back down to the ghetto, so he kind of set us back. Um, so, you know, my grandfather used to always cater to us because he grew up like us and he would always tell me, don't worry about what your father doing. You just focus on being better than him so you can get your kids out of here. So, uh, And that's his son he's talking about. Yeah, that's his son he's talking about. So I kind of always set my goals to what my grandfather had. He had the big house, you know, every two, three years he got new cars, you know, so it was like I was chasing that. I was like, you know, I need to be like my grandfather. When he passed away, he had certain insurances that paid off the house and money that left that was left to his wife. Uh, he put his all his kids through college, and um, <clears throat> you know, he had a third grade education coming from Mississippi, Alabama area, right? So um, I I set my mind to to surpassing him or being like him. And I got off to a rocky start. Um, my first, my firstborn, my son was born in 1994. I'm already in prison. Uh, I'm in a, yeah, he was born in 1994. So I'm in prison as a juvenile, but I'm in a, a men's facility. So before you go, so, so the UK is a bit different. So you can be a minor in age and you'll be in prison with grown men. So I, <clears throat> I was one of the first situations that they charge a minor charge as an adult. They said you're unfit. They tried to send me back to use authority, a place I'd already been. But uh, they sent the letter down from Sacramento, which is our capital, and told him due to his level of sophistication 
and manipulation. We don't want him back in our facilities. So now I'm stuck. I got a felony offense. It can't go to a juvenile facility. It was a gift and a curse because I was looking at like 17 years. So the female judge, um, <clears throat> she's scratching her head. She's like, I don't know what to do with you. She's like, um, if I gave you a time reduction, will you sign a waiver to go to state prison? If not, they were going to have to hold me in a juvenile facility, probably me in uh, lock up the whole solitary confinement until I turned 18, so two years, and then sent me to the facility. Um, so I, I'm like, yeah, so they should reduce my time. By this time, my mentality is that anyway. I'd have been to juvenile hall, juvenile camp, youth authority. I'm big, I'm buff, my mentality, I'm fighting. You know, I'm like, okay, well, send me up there with the homies. That was just my mentality. <clears throat> but I was a failure. I was a success at getting a street reputation as a gangster and a hustler. I was very successful at that, right? But I was a failure because I was a father in prison. So the very things that I held against my father because he was on drugs and wasn't there for me, I was falling off into the same lane. Rather, I was on drugs where I was gang banging, hustling. If it took me away from my children, right? I was the same person. And it scared me because to this day, I don't call my father, father, or dad. I call him by his name because of the lack of respect that was instilled in me from the beginning. So <clears throat> I accepted the fact every day I had this ritual, right? After I got through doing my push-up routine and, and I did my hygiene, I would look in the our mirror, which was a stainless steel plate, you could see a little blur of your shadow. And I would greet myself. And I would call myself a bitch-ass nigga. You know you a bitch-ass nigga. Your son's on the street and you're in prison. This ain't gangster. So I started to detox and debrief from chasing the goal of being a gangster and a hustler to trying to understand on what it was going to take to be a successful father. I think what's interesting about that is when, when, does the, when do the values converge? Because I think everyone's heart, they know what's, to an extent what's right, what's wrong, but the streets takes us to a certain path. But it seems like you did have that awakening. And I'm just wondering, even at that point, when you do end up coming out, how do you still, like the cycle being broken couldn't have been straight away. Was it still time after you came out or was it? No, um, <clears throat> my transition from being a gang banger started probably about, after about two years in prison, because at this point in time, I'm starting to understand that the so-called enemy, the so-called crip, he's really not my enemy unless I want him to be. See. He's plagued with the same situations I'm plagued with. Growing up in a broken home, uh, dealing, trying to fend for himself. The only difference between him and me is his parents raised him on that side of the track and my parents raised me on this side of the track. And because of the ignorance of gangbanging, right? We're taught, fuck them, screw them. You're not taught to get to know this individual just he has on a certain color because he's the enemy. And it wasn't until maybe a decade later that I started to understand where certain beefs come from. Like for what I represent, Paru, the Paru Crip beef came from one guy stole another guy's leather jacket. And over the years, you got thousands of people in jail, thousands of people dead behind two individuals and a leather jacket. Regardless of what you think you in there for, the light of that fire that's blazing across the country, other cities, other states, is based on two individuals in a leather jacket. So I tell myself, I'm doing prison behind two strangers I don't know in a leather jacket, right? So. 
uh, meeting people. Be, you know, you go to a facility, bro, you ain't got no soap or deodorant because you waiting on your things to catch up with you. But then it's a man that looks like me coming to the door and say, hey, black man, there you go. And it's a toothpaste and toothbrush and soap and deodorant. You're thankful. Then you later find out that this man is a crib. Right? You know what I mean? So it's kind of like, do you continue to make them your enemy because of what they were forced to do as you were forced to do it? But then you greet every man as a man, which now supports that growth to become a better man as a father to your child. Right? See, doing it the other way keeps you fighting and stabbing and catching time which keeps me away from my child. Doing it this way, right, uh, gives me a little more assurance that I might get to my child. So, you know, um, fatherhood was very, very important to me. And for my son's first five years of his life, I was not a father. And every day of his life, if he wanted that, I definitely owe him an apology, right? Because I wasn't there to instill. I didn't see those first steps. I didn't change that diaper. I didn't hold him in my arms and feed him. I can't claim any of that. His mother could claim that. So, you know, when it came to my daughter, they're 10 years apart, literally. They were literally set to be born on the same day. She came 30 days early as a pre, literally, literally, same date, the 26th, he's August 26th, she was supposed to be born August 26th, she came July 26th, right, so it was, but her life, um, you know, when she was born, she's never seen sidewalks in front of her house, right, she doesn't know about dad, she knows about dad was in prison, but that wasn't part of her life, you know, she's seen dad in the, in the, in the house, you know, I was, a participant of her growing up, you know, I did her hair as best I could. <laughs> you know what I mean? So, you know, um, yeah, and I went through the struggles. Coming home from prison, bro, was a struggle. You know, I had friends that would say, hey, here's this, go make a couple hundred thousand. That was tempting versus go get this job that pays you $6.50 an hour. Having the image that I have. You know what I mean? But I understood before the fall comes a pride. So every, you know, every time I, I thought about taking that chance, I would think about my son. And it was nothing that was worth being away from him. So whatever I had to go through, I went through. That's a, that's a great uh, trait of character you've got. Because some men, not they don't care about their sons, but they don't care that much to change, to make that a transition. I think, you know, I've never been in jail. I've got quite a few friends who have been. Right. But yeah, no. Nah. But again, it's like I'm lucky. Both my parents are in the house, still married for like 45 years. But even you could have been influenced by peer pressure around you. Yeah. But like you, I don't, I don't smoke, I don't drink. So I just try and always keep a, a clear mind because I think I can see where it can go. You, when you see an example of that's not really going to have the outcome you want, you don't really follow it unless you're just, I won't say weak or minded, but th there is always peer pressure. But what I wondered is like, not even as a deterrent, like when you're in prison, what are some of the, I won't say the worst things, but some of the things that really shocked you that you saw in, in prison. I think the worst thing that um, <clears throat> happened to me in prison, mentally and subconsciously, is the fact that you go through a numbing. You know what I mean? It's kind of like, uh, like you're taught and you're trained. It's a man can get stabbed to death right in front of you. You don't see it, you step right over the body and you keep moving. You don't call for help. You don't try to help. <clears throat> you mind your business, right? Um, the mentality of being able to smile at the top of a dime, being able to attack because it's based on survival, right? It's kind of like having an a animalistic instinct and a rage that's all, always burning inside you that's caged up in a barred cage. So that means it's not in a box. It's really not being contained. Because when you're in a barred cage, those flames are still breathing, right? So it doesn't take much to trigger you. 
And <clears throat> coming home, I, 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 I BS you now, brother, certain places I couldn't go. I didn't realize until I went, going to the mall. I go to the top floor, people bumping into me. That's reason enough for as you call a knifing or we call it sticking or a fight. But in, in normal everyday society, people are just moving. It's the hustle and bustle. The railing, that's a tear to me. People get through over that. I literally put my back against the wall, bro, and had to kind of catch myself and breathe. I wasn't ready for that. Walking into a restaurant, sitting down, and instead of me looking at whoever I'm there with, I'm scanning the room. And when you're scanning the room and you look at people, people look back at you. That look to me is confrontational. But yet I'm not there, I'm here. So it was like, kind of like rehabilitating yourself and entering society takes a while. Even down to a point, brother, taking a shower. I mean, for at least a month or two, I got in the shower with my boxers on because that's what we do. We wash our, our boxers in the shower, right? It, it didn't, you know what I mean? So, you know, um, being able to come back into society and be civil and not say this dude's looking at me, I'm going to do something to him. Instead of this dude's looking at me, let me give him a nod and a wave. Maybe he'll give me a nod and a wave back, right? So it's kind of like, being able to integrate yourself, it, it kind of, it took that from me. And even today, I'm numb. Like, I can isolate myself in this room, no problem, as long as I can see what's going on outside of the room, right? And it shouldn't be like that. Um, certain things that would affect a normal citizen, a human being, doesn't affect me because I know how to convert. You know what I mean? If they said right now, Yo, it's a gunman. It's a problem in the hallway. Most people are going to lock the door. <laughs> I'm going to go in the hallway. And I think my biggest threat to myself, my biggest weakness is the fact that I don't fear. I don't fear those type of things. We all wake up and we fear, you know, something happening to our loved ones and things like that. But I don't fear going into the fire. It's just... Uh, um, you know, you tell yourself if it's supposed to happen, it's gonna happen, right? And, and and that's not, it's not a good feeling. Like I have to like talk myself out of things. You know what I mean? I know it sounds crazy, but it's like it's this little birdie on my shoulder. There's two of them. It's, you know, he's telling me, get him. What, you going for that? And the other one's telling me, hey man, you got a million dollar deal you're closing next week and your daughter, your daughter's cheer uh, event is next week, and your son's doing this and this and that. Stay the course. So, you know, over years, I've been home 24 years, and the birdie's still there. He might be a little parakeet now, but he's still there. And this is why um, I stay away from certain types of people because they don't know. And even in society, a lot of people understand there are all kind of people out here. And I tell people, greet a person with respect because you never know what you're dealing with. I tell women, don't send your significant other out to home angry because you never know what that may trigger. You know what I mean? But ultimately it comes down to us as men to be able to control that. And that's probably my, my biggest challenge is on a daily controlling that. And, and dealing with situations in a civil manner. I think, do you know what's also, I think, inspiring is, I've wondered where did the business acumen come into it? Because is it, was it the truck, you had the trucks? Yeah. But like, and we'll get into the, um, to the music and what's going on currently, but even then, like that, where did that acumen, was that from your grandfather? Like, where did well, it come from? The business came from the streets, and the, the, the streets, the hustle of the street. Um, I was always a straight A student. Really? Yeah, I was a straight A student always. I graduated early. I never saw the sixth grade. I went from the fifth grade to the seventh grade. Um, yeah, I've always was ahead of the, the, my class. People that know me will tell you that, right? Um, but the streets um, is what really taught me the business. Even the things I do today, like I got a diaper company that's launching in a month. 
right? Even the things I do today, the trucking, the music. Um, <clears throat> it's a product and it's distribution. So if I go back to the streets where I come from, the streets of Pacoima, right? Right? The cheap product was drugs, crack, marijuana, things of that nature, or even firearms, right? The more distribution you had, the more drugs you could sell, the more drugs you could sell, the more money you make, right? So I understood product and distribution. So now my thing is, if you can create a product that you can distribute, that's legal. I eliminate the stress and the risk and the danger, right? Now my risk factor just comes down to my marketing scheme and how much I'm paying for the product, right? And I was always pretty good at knowing how to cut the middleman out to get to the product, right? So this is why I took several trips to China, direct, and I've been in a little old raggedy Jeep going straight to the warehouse, no middleman. So when most people will uh, be paying 40 cent per piece, I'm paying 14, right? Modern day Frank Lucas, same thing, right? Uh, better product because he's getting it for a great rate. He can sell it for less cost. I took the negative and applied it to a positive. Same thing with the trucks. It was like they have this thing called deadhead. You either load it and then deadhead means you have a truck with nothing in the trailer. So the standard way of doing business and trucking was you want to be loaded both ways. So that we would go from Oxnard to like Seattle, Washington, 1,000 mile, 1,100 mile run. It pay you like $7,000. It costs you about $500 in fuel one way. The load coming back, it was maybe a fuel load. It was just to have some money. Maybe pay you two grand, twenty five hundred. So you might get there on a Tuesday. And they'll say, hey, we're not going to have no loads until Thursday. So the thing for most drivers to do, the regular drivers, they will sit their truck. We made seven grand up. I'm waiting to make my two, three thousand coming back. I'll wait till Thursday. Me? I'm calling down the Oxnard dispatch and say, hey, you got another load coming up? They're like, yeah, we got a couple of them. I'll be back down. I'll go back down, get another $7,000 load coming up, and still be back in time to get the two, $3,000 load. Their mentality was, man, you just spent $500 driving down there for fuel? Where I come from, $500 driving down, pick up a load for $7,000, that cost me another $500 going back up, $6,000 profit from $1,000 in fuel. Where I come from, that $1,000, right, represented the profit that I would have made off an ounce of cocaine that cost me $500, right? And I doubled it up to a thousand. So you telling me I'm spending a thousand dollars and I'm coming back six thousand profit? I don't understand what you're saying. In my world, that's great money. So I would just and they like, but at the end of the year, when they may have generated two hundred thousand, I had a truck that generated three fifty. Why? Because I wasn't seeing it that way. Thousand dollars in fuel, six thousand profit. Right? That's what I was doing. I would look at the $2,000 load as just the fuel money. Everything else stayed in my pocket. So I saw a difference. So it was like a, a gift and a curse, my upbringing. Because I went through the things I went through, I saw the things that I, that, that I saw. I was able to adapt and adjust in the real world and say, well, I'm not going to. I see what they're doing, but it's still a profit margin. Little risk because I got to drive. I could have had an accident. Anything could have happened. More risk at, um, you know, damaging the load. You know, that comes with it. But I wasn't taking the risk of five to ten years in prison. With anything come risk. 
So, you know, and, and that's what that was. And I built my fleet. And from that, I went in, uh, went into real estate and from real estate to music. Like I would literally be on the road. So I'll get a call. We need game in Texas. And I park my truck, jump on a plane and fly to Texas and meet the artists in Texas. My truck would be sitting at a truck stop. Jump back on a plane, get back. My 10 hour reset that I had to pull over was me flying to Texas, doing what I had to do with the artists, flying back, getting back in my truck. And could, I was literally operating my truck, maintaining the fleet and managing and working the label at the same time. So the, the, the music portion of things, um, I, was, I know you, the, the whole death row, I mean, I do listen to a lot of the clubhouse conversations. At what point did you actually, were you involved with death row in any way? Um, 1999, 2000. And it was a gentleman named Reggie Wright yes, that was running death row at the time, who was the ex Compton PD that should have put in place to run death row and to run in security. Um, so Sugar at the time was in prison. But back then, when you're in prison in California, you're hearing about the guys is doing this, the shakers and the bakers, you know what I mean? So it's like, <clears throat> yo, this dude over here in Folsom, this dude in Soledad, this homie's in Corcoran, this, this, that, and other. So while he's sitting in prison, homie's just coming through photo albums, who is this, that's this. So he got, he knew of me that way. He didn't get to know me until Reggie Wright made that call and was like, yo, Pooh Rider was already at death row at security, street security, up under their payroll, driving their cars, living in their homes. So that's my home as a childbirth. Me and Reggie bonded because Reggie like, well, you're a little different. You want to conduct some business. We should call him and let him know we need you around here. So what he did was gave me access. I would never take a death row chain because then at that point, you're under that Simon Says BS. Man, like when people call him Simon, corrupt does it a lot. I won't call him that because that means something. Well, I got to go to the store because Simon said go. You got my chain on your neck. I'm paying you driving my car. You're living in my house, right? So I didn't want that. I just wanted the access to do business. So I got to um, give my death row credit to my homeboy, Pooh Rider, rest in peace, and uh, Reggie Wright who let me in the door and made the call. So I was moving with Reggie probably about eight or nine months prior to Suge even coming home. Now, once Suge came home and we started talking and I would move a few places with him, he knew I was a little different from the rest. I had my own things. I was already pulling up in Escalades and Mercedes Benz legally. When he realized I was doing it legally, so he would call me, where you at in my truck? Man, you really, yeah, I own the truck, it's my contracts. You know what I mean? Every BMW, Porsche, um, Audi, Volkswagen uh, that came through the West Coast from Germany, from Europe, we took to the dealers. So I was getting 250, 300, 350,000, right, from my truck. Then I had a fleet behind me that I kept a third off each truck. So it was like, you know, no, you can't pull me to come hang out at death row all day. But when I get in on Friday or Thursday night, and you want to meet or uh, whatever, I can come down, have a conversation. So that's that's kind of where that came from. But you ask me real life questions that your people, my people, and where we come from need to hear. Because a lot of people are told if you don't have education or if you've been to jail or you have a felony, it's over with. No, it's not. I can stand on I can stand on the side of many doctors and attorneys and businessmen and bankers and guarantee you they don't have the financial profile that I have. Hey, listen, I'm a rule. You told me when I come to London to pull up to ADTV. I'm here. Open the door and let's see what you about. Let's get to it. He was doing all that talking. Now, let's have a conversation.